All right. Well, welcome to the Entheogenic Explore podcast. I am Kirby, and I have with me again Dr. Martin Ball, who has been a frequent guest on the podcast, uh, just somebody that I've enjoyed. Uh, I enjoy these conversations. This isn't work to me at all. Um, so as always, thank you for taking some time and, and and being on the show with me. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, just I love the the mutual sharing. I've had you on my podcast a couple of times and now, you know, on yours a couple of times. And I just love the collaboration and sharing of wisdom and information. So it's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah, I appreciate it. I always do. Every time we have one of these and it goes up, I always get that's when I get the most calls. Uh, it, it seems like people are uh, enjoying the interaction. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's it's at least entertaining, if nothing else. Um, but for folks that don't know you, can you just give us just a quick, uh, quick bit about your personal journey, how you became involved with maybe psychedelics and maybe even particularly your, your work with 5-MeO-DMT? All right. So I'll give you... Um two introductions. So the first one is the universal introduction that I like to start with. So um, I am a localized embodiment of the universal consciousness that is identified with this particular physical vehicle and the personality construct that is known as Martin. And so when then we're talking about Martin, what we're talking about is, um, boy, just to give a brief biography, uh, earned my PhD in religious studies, um, went in as sort of a spiritual seeker, agnostic kind of person, was not raised with the kind of any spirituality and a religion uh, within my life uh, from my family. But I was very curious about the, the deeper questions, like, does anybody really know what's going on here? And then how how do we know if we, if we think we know? And do we actually know the things that we think we know? And, and that kind of stuff. So I'd... Um, started in philosophy in college and then kind of gravitated towards religious studies because I became very enamored with Buddhist philosophy. Um, but as a graduate student, got involved in studying Native American religions, did some field work at the Mescalero Apache Reservation for um, an extended period of time. That was a basis for my dissertation. Actually, you can see way in the back over there. Let's see if I can get my finger right. Okay. That's a Mescalero Apache mountain spirit dancer in that painting back there by a Mescalero uh, artist, Oliver and Jotty. That was the subject of my uh, PhD dissertation. I could talk about that for a long time. Um, but anyway, uh, had kind of spurred along my own particular interest in psychedelic medicines um, as sort of a extracurricular activity as a PhD student and studied what I could uh, within the context of religious studies. Um, I think that the landscape is really, really different today. I mean, we're talking, this was um, 94 to 2000 um, when I was a graduate student. And uh, there's a lot more information available today about how entheogens and psychedelics are used not only within traditional um, indigenous cultures, but also historically within some of the main religious traditions of the world. So it's a very different landscape today, but I had to study all that on my own as a student. And um, yeah, so I went in the uh, January of 2008 with my first full release experience of 5-MeO DMT. I went from sort of a speculative non-dual philosopher to what I would call an embodied non-dualist, um, which ended all the speculation. Um, so it radically transformed my worldview just within one immediate experience. And that precip precipitated a period of deep transformation, what I like to call um, energetic recalibration, which was fueled by um, about once a month use of 5-MeO-DMT at a full release dose and um, a lot of ayahuasca attending the local Santo Daime church here in Ashland and drinking ayahuasca several times a month and really processing into a new mode of being, which came to a rather radical point of completion in the spring of 2009. And I do like to tell people at that point, it, it was fundamentally like I was tripping 5-MeO-DMT pretty much constantly at various levels for about three months um, and just integrated that. And I, I know we're going to be talking about integration today. And, you know, people ask me like, well, what did, where did you go for integration during this time period? It's like, it wasn't even a fucking word back then. Like nobody was even talking about integration and let alone that certainly there were people using 5-MeO DMT before me, but um, there at that time, there was almost nothing written about it. 
people didn't know what it was. People constantly confused it with quote unquote regular DMT. Um, so there, there was no one to go to for any kind of integration or guidance in any way, shape or form. So I just had to navigate this all myself. And then because I had to navigate all this myself, that I decided I really want to educate the world about 5-MeO-DMT. And so at this point, I have written and shared and talked more about 5-MeO-DMT than anybody else in the history of humanity, really, because I've just devoted myself to this since 2009, um, while it's still maintaining my creative and artistic pursuit. So it's not the only thing that I do by any means. Um, and I was an underground facilitator of 5-MeO-DMT uh, for seven years from 2009 to 2016. Also during that time, I mean, now Toad and 5-MeO facilitators, I mean, they're just popping up all around the world. They're all over the place. But during that time period, um, I mostly knew only two or three other people who were serving. So it was like a very, very small circle there was no like community feedback or, you know, there's no classes, there's no training programs, nothing like that. So it was, it was all very wild west in a sense and uh, developed my own methodology, which was very unique and came out of my own experiences and then retired from that. And, um, you know, I've had some medical issues in the recent years, which has had a deep impact on my life, but, you know, still chugging away at it all. And um, yeah, I've written a whole bunch of books about 5-MeO from a variety of different um, perspectives and, and topics, including a couple novels um, about the subject. And uh, yeah, that brings me up to today, I guess, pretty much. That's me <laughs> well, that's in a nutshell. Perfect. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because when you started off, uh, one of the things that I enjoy about these conversations is the introduction. And um, for folks that maybe have an experience 5-MeO, and, and I, I should say that because what, one of the things I want to talk about is the difference between 5-MeO and some of the more common or classical psychedelics and those experiences and how to integrate it. Um, again, integration is the, the the theme for today. We've got our uh, Unchurch University, we've got our uh, uh, Psychedelic Integration Specialist course coming up in January. But again, we've talked, um, integrating this experience is different because it is a different experience. But my, my question is, um, when you start off your introduction, again, you I won't be able to word it the same way you do, but you you're you're trying to express to people and, and and correct me if I'm wrong, this understanding that Martin Ball that we see on the screen, Kirby that we see on the screen, this is just a character. It's a role, one of many roles that we play throughout our life. The difference is you and I see it as this role. We see it as the character before the podcast. I'm like, okay, Kirby's got a podcast. What's the uniform of Kirby? You know, what what are all these these pieces? What are you know your set and setting, but understanding that you're you're more than that, that a good portion of Kirby is 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 a, a programmed version, but be able to see this program version from a different space. When did you so you said for your first experience, you were already down the non-dual rabbit hole on on some level. So having yeah. the five minute experience was more of a yep, that's it. For me, no concept of non-duality stepping into the space. So it was a completely different experience of like, what is that? I'm not that. Um, so that experience of that non-dual, I think it is unique. It's not unique to 5 me. I mean, I, I, I facilitated other experiences where people have had it, but it seems out of all the classical psychedelics or the more common psychedelics that it's more common to have this egoic death um this this connection with with everything and this realization of the separation between yourself and your ego where you could see the programming would you agree that it is different than common psychedelics and if so what would you say the unique experience difference is yeah it is absolutely different from any other psychedelic that's out there and the way that i've been describing this since my own experience in 2008 <clears throat> is that it's the premier tool for non-dual experience that exists yeah. within reality, that there really isn't anything else that it compares. And even the fact that we're talking about non-duality in conjunction with psychedelic experience, um, in some ways, I'm largely responsible for that because I was the one who back in 2008 started saying, okay, this this is 
the non-dual experience as mediated through 5-MeO-DMT. And prior to that, like nobody was really talking, nobody used that language of non-duality within the context of psychedelics. And particularly back at that time, everybody was interested in 2012 and machine elves and all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with quote unquote non-duality or the ultimate nature of being. And this is where 5-MeO, um, you know, I had tried other various psychedelics before my experience with 5-MeO. And so I, I would describe myself, as I said, sort of as a speculative non-dual philosopher. And by that, I mean, I mean that I thought that that was probably the way things were in some sense. You know, I'd read enough Buddhist philosophy and it made enough sense to me. It's like, yeah, this, this is probably how things are. But do I know that that's how things are? No, I've, I've never had this experience, I've had intuitions that this is correct. I've felt that this is correct, but not an overwhelming experience that I would consider just to be flat out undeniable. Whereas that's what the 5-MeO-DMT experience was. And it was still, I, I want to emphasize that it was still incredibly surprising for me. So it wasn't just, oh, this is what I've always thought. It's like, oh shit, this is real. Like this is, this is happening right now. Like this is really it. And um, also I, I am the progenitor of the term, the God molecule. And that's because with my first experience with 5-MeO-DMT that prior to that, I was really uncomfortable with the word God. I didn't use it. I would talk about, you know, universal consciousness or, you know, something like that, but, but not God. But from that experience, my takeaway was, holy shit, I just met God. And not only did I meet God, but I experienced the truth that God is the only thing that actually exists. And it is this universal intelligence that is made out of the pure energy of unconditional love, which that's, that's its fundamental nature. And it is everyone and everything. And so that means that includes Everything that I think is Martin, including my body, my thoughts, my breath, my heartbeat, what I see, what I hear, what I taste, what I experience, and also the egoic identity that I have that, hello, that this is Martin. But within that experience, that, that sense of being Martin was transcended within a few seconds. And then it was this merging into this ecstatic state of infinite unconditional love that was conscious and aware. And it knew that it was me and I knew that I was it and it knew that it was everything. So that mean I, I knew that I was everything. And this is not in any way unique experience with 5-MeO-DMT, that th right. this is the pinnacle of the 5-MeO experience and that anybody who hasn't experienced that but has tried 5-MeO, they haven't gotten the full package of what 5-MeO has to offer. So this is radically distinct from other psychedelic experiences, in most cases, that like as you say, people can have a quote unquote ego death experience and also have a non-dual or mystical unitive experience on other psychedelics, but it's just not as likely. And usually in most cases, um, I refer to it as non-duality light. Okay. Yeah. So for example, with some, say something like mushrooms or ayahuasca, it's very common for people to say, I felt that I was a part of everything. And I had certainly had that experience on mushrooms and you're out walking through the woods and you're just, you're looking at the trees and you hear the birds and the insects and you're like, oh my God, we're, we're all part of the same thing. Like we're all connected. So that sense of connectivity still relies on the idea that, well, there's a me that is connected to quote unquote everything yeah. else. Whereas this is the complete dissolution of that sense of me versus everything else, where it all dissolves into this absolute state of unity and there's nothing to perceive there there is no otherness so there's no forest there's no trees there's no birds there's no animals there's no me walking through the forest it is just the, the immediacy of this infinite fractal structure of energy that is this vibration of love that is self-aware and so most other psychedelics don't bring you to that state and if they do it's usually for a very only sh very very brief time period. Like it's common um, for people to say, well, on mushrooms, I had a couple seconds of that. And then I, boom, I kind of fell back into myself or on ayahuasca, I had like a glimpse of that and then immediately fell back down. So it's very hard for people to sustain because 
the human ego is an incredibly resilient compilation of these energetic patterns and structures that it is their nature to try and reassemble themselves as soon and as quickly as they can. And also from my own experience of, of this nature of the non-dual nature of being, what I concluded pretty quickly was that um, the resilient structures of the ego are very, very difficult to override. And so what happens in most psychedelic experiences is what we do is we loosen them, we alter them, we open up new pathways. So the language that now gets used is that we're disrupting the default mode network. Right. Okay. But the key is most psychedelics do not completely override the default mode network. They just alter it and they disrupt it so that people have different experiences. And it was also at this time that I realized that most people were using the term ego death for things that aren't actually ego death, where they're saying, well, you know, I didn't know who I was and I was floating around in the universe and I was talking to these aliens and that was my ego death experience. That's not ego death at all because there's still a subject and object that's present yes. that the ego creates both subject and object simultaneously. So even if you're in an extremely altered state, you don't know who you are, you don't know where you are, but you're interacting with beings or in a realm and you're having ideas about what this realm is and what you're interacting with, by definition, that experience is being filtered and constructed through the ego. So that that's why I don't really like to use the term ego death because it gets used so often. And in most, I would say 95% of the cases where people use the term ego death, it's not the full non-dual experience. And so for me, it doesn't really qualify for what I'd want to call ego death, which is what happens when we take enough 5-MeO-DMT and also fundamentally choose to release into it. Um, so that's just in a nutshell, that's that's where 5-MeO-DMT is just fundamentally different. And, and that's also why, again, I chose to call it the God molecule because this is a molecule that will reveal to you not that not, you're not going to go visit with God. You're going to realize, oh shit, it's what I actually am. And that this is just a filtering down of that universal consciousness into a particular form with a particular identity that allows this window onto the energetic construct that is reality. But behind all of it is this universal actor that's playing all these different characters simultaneously. But in 99.99% of the time, I'm limited to this particular perspective, this particular viewpoint. Whereas there are plenty of cases on 5-MeO where people say, I felt everyone and everything, and I was looking out of everybody's eyes simultaneously. Like that is an experience that people can have. But, and they also say, you know, can I sustain that? I say, no, and thank God we can't because then we'd never get anything done. Like, you know, we have to winnow things down to a particular view so that we can actually interact with reality. So we catch glimpses of that, of sort of the fractal totality of being within the 5-MeO experience. But we should all be grateful that we're not living in that all the time because that was just completely non-functional. Yeah, and, and I think to your your, your point, I, I try to share with folks, understanding, even from a compassion standpoint, for the first six to seven years of your life, your brain's in beta. It's essentially just in hypnosis, evolutionary. You're just absorbing how to be. Then you become conscious. But you're running out that program then. So I think this misconception about the amount of free will people think that they have um, is an important aspect that free, that through my experiences, it showed me. Again, it, it was that, for me, the first time, my first experience really was this fracturing of Kirby and then like the authentic self. It was like, oh, that is a character. Holy shit, that's a character. Um, and then as you're, you know, and then as you're, you know, integrating that experience, basically living life, that's when you start... That's the interesting part with that experience is, you know, folks will have the experience of like, I don't know what happened. I'm like, it takes time, right? You, it, It's like you got a new set of glasses, you got a new set of lenses, the way that you're going to see reality is just going to be sh uh, slightly different. You have to actually go out and, and wear those glasses. So for me personally, it was this difference of, I would say something, I'm like, oh, that's what you do. You do, right? This this other version, this outly version, I'm like, oh, that's what you do. That's what Kirby says. That's how Kirby responds. 
Um, and it's one of those experiences that I just cannot emphasize enough how life-changing that is to see the character that you are right and I remember for the first week after my experience I would say things and this little uh alarm would go off my head and say ego I would say something I'm like oh you're saying that so they'll think that you've got something important to say or you said that for why are you saying that well you're just trying to chime in and be it, it was like this alarm system to your egoic patterns and how you're showing up most people never get a glimpse of that. If you never get a glimpse of that, how do you deprogram that? How do you start unwinding that? Right. And I think that is the power of this molecule versus, again, an ayahuasca experience or a psilocybin experience. Yes, you get some valuable information. You can get some insights. But those insights are still being interpreted through this lens of the ego. Right. So, you know, a lot of folks will have, like you said, very similar experiences. I had an, an ego death. Again, I, I hear it a lot too, especially in the I uh, uh, ceremonies. I, 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 I did. I'm like, there's too many eyes in that statement for it yeah. to be an ego death. So close, but it is different. And the difference is literally that, that I am everything. And that's the experience that you had. And we've had this part of the conversation several times. And it's actually one of my favorite parts of the conversation because I'm I'm in your camp and also kind of not in your camp, um, mostly because I don't want to be in your camp, but you're probably right. And that is that experience that you have of, I am everything and there's nothing outside of me, right? So if that is the case, if that is the facts, one of my concerns with the spiritual community and, and, and you impacted me in this, because if you would ask me five years ago, the nature of reality, I would have had it probably would have sounded like Ram Dass um, or any of these other gurus that were impactful to me. Right. So if you, if if what you're saying is the truth, then that impacts so many pieces that we hear in the spiritual community reincarnation. Right. If we're just one. And death happens and now we are part of the eternal. Right. We are just that. Well, reincarnations off the table yep spirit guides are off the table yep um a lot of these wooey um concepts that are pretty common in the spiritual community now don't fit what, yeah. what are your thoughts on that so i get in a lot of trouble with this one um because there's a lot of magical people out there that have you know spiritual powers um and this is their mantra this is their this is their badge of honor this is their specialty um what are your thoughts Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's, there's so much here that I'd just love to comment on. And that this is the thing is that the genuine non-dual experience, I think is absolutely destructive of all spiritual and religious belief because it reveals immediately. I made a bunch of shit up and then went around behaving as though those things that I just made up were true. And I've been building my life off of these constructs that are simply irrelevant. They just don't exist in any way, shape or form. Even yeah. though the gurus tell me, even though the spiritual and religious books tell me this stuff, that it's just not true. Um, so going and, back- And, and to- not to cut you off, I, I want to throw in, I'm going to get this back because this is the most important piece of where I'm, or one of the most important pieces. My concern is- because this is going to be about integration and proper guidance. My concern is, and I, I will throw myself under the bus too, I was one of those people that thought I knew the nature of reality. So we're sharing that nature of reality with people that are open and they're, they're looking to us as if we had the answers, right? Which is the first mistake of looking at a facilitator, like they know more than you, but that is the case that happens. So now this information is being put into their their hands and now they're taking that information as if it's truth and now they're down this rabbit hole so what i'm finding in the spiritual community we have a lot of folks that don't necessarily know i don't i have theories i don't know it would be wrong for me to tell you the nature of reality when i don't ultimately know it because the amount of time i spent wasted down rabbit holes thinking about some of these things right so my concern is in the spiritual community that we're pushing that on people or we're influencing people with this information and a desire to be special as if we know some insight that they don't and we're leading them astray. Sorry to cut you off. That's quite all right. Yeah. So through my own experience that I, you know, again, seeing, seeing the ego dissolve. And then kind of as you're saying, this is what's also unique about 5-MeO. When you get all the way out of the ego then you do get the opportunity to actually watch it come back 
and you see there's a layer, there's a layer, there's the stories that I tell myself, those are the beliefs that I have, those are the ways that I express myself. And then afterwards, you really clearly see, oh, look, I, I just went into that unconscious pattern again. Like I brought in all that backstory of yes. all that stuff I've made up, and now I'm engaging from that. Why yeah. am I doing that? And so it really puts the ego in your face in that sense that you become hyper aware of what it's yeah. doing. And one of the things that the ego is doing all the time is it's asking, what does this mean? What am I supposed to do? And what, what can I achieve from this? And that's where when, when we use that lens and we look at most spiritual and religious teachings, we can see that what they're doing is they're saying, oh, you're very special because you've got these, you're going to develop these special skills and you need to get this special knowledge and you're going to understand and see things that other people don't. And then they're going to use that to develop an identity for yourself that sets you apart in some capacity. And it's actually all this feeding back into that sense of self. But if you just see the self as, oh, it's just a temporary configuration of energy that is a person personalized and individualized expression of this universal consciousness, the things that this individualized identity is making up about itself are just that things that it's making up about itself. Like, so we can take the concept of reincarnation that says, um, I have some kind of immortal soul or some stream of consciousness that is going from life to life. Well, okay. But most reincarnation beliefs also say, and you're on a journey of discovering the truth. And if you behave badly, you're going to get a bad incarnation. If you behave well, you're going to get a good incarnation. Now, here's my list of what counts as good behavior. And here's my list of what counts as bad behavior. <laughs> and this is what's going to get you a good rebirth. And this is what's going to get you a bad rebirth. And then here's also what's going to happen once you've actually figured all this shit out and you've reached this state of enlightenment. And one of the things I love to point out, you know, have, again, having my PhD in religious studies is that you can go to these reincarnation religious traditions that have this belief. None of them agree about what drives reincarnation. None of them agree about what actually is reincarnated. And not a single one of them agree about what is the end result of being enlightened and escaping the cycle of reincarnation. Now, if any of this were true, you would think that there might be actually some consistency among these different traditions. There isn't. There is no consistency. Um, so that's the first clue right there that we're dealing with beliefs because we're not dealing with anything that is consistent that we can objectively observe and say, well, yes, this, this is fundamentally true. So there's this deconstruction that takes place um, through the dismantling of the ego. And there's the letting go of these beliefs and these ideas and the identities that are constructed around them. And especially in modern Western culture, a lot of these beliefs have been adopted from outside. Now, for example, again, with the, the issue of reincarnation, like I live in Ashland, Oregon. It's a big spiritual place. People just assume you believe in reincarnation that, you know, it comes up in conversation all the time or they, or that people believe or assume that you believe that actually your spirit came from another star system to incarnate here on earth in order to be a light bringer or something like that. And it's, I mean, you can just hear the stories being told. So a lot of this stuff is just adopted because it appeals to someone's sense of self in some way, not because they've done rigorous study and said, yes, I accept this is true. It's just like, oh, well, that sounds cool to me. And then they create an identity around it. And then people start dressing that way. And then they start oh, bowing to people and saying namaste. And, you know, they're all doing this and that. And, oh, well, let's do a puja offering or whatever. Let's sing some kirtan. And, you know, it's fine, but all of that, really what it's doing is that it's, is about building a community of like-minded individuals. And we are social animals, human beings. We are animals. Let's just accept it. We are very social in nature and we're very self-referential. Like I was just thinking the other day about how almost everything that humans do is in reference to other humans, right? Where... um you know, we look at art made by other humans. We listen to music made by other humans. We watch TV shows with people talking about their experiences and their relationships. And, you know, everything is like self-referential. 
um, in this interesting way so that we are this very self-reflective kind of animal where we're very fascinated by what humans can do, by what they can create, by what they can make up. And then we want to build communities around that. So it, that's normal and it's natural um, that we build these communities of quote unquote like-minded people and build identities around it but they're all just social constructs. It's just a form of game playing. And so this is where we go back into other psychedelic experiences, like relieving trauma through MDMA or a psilocybin therapy. You're entering into a dualistic projected environment within your mind where you're relating to different aspects of yourself and different aspects of your personal history and different aspects of your imagination. You're interacting with them. You're moving energies that might be pent up and tr transforming them. You're releasing, you know, years of trauma, but mostly what's happening in those experiences is if we have the game board of being, what you're doing is you're repositioning pieces on the game board and then you're saying, okay, this is more functional. This works better for me and I feel better. Okay. And so that's where most psychedelic therapy or psychedelic transformation is just rearranging pieces on the board or maybe, maybe even saying, you know what, I don't like this board. I'm going to get a new board. I'm going to put new pieces on there. There, I've been transformed. What 5-MeO does is it says, there is no board. There are no game pieces on the board. Not in the way that you think there are. Because actually, it's all just you in a really fundamental sense and not the egoic sense. It's not that Martin is Kirby or that Kirby is Martin. It is that there is the same universal consciousness that is simultaneously experiencing itself as Kirby from that perspective and as Martin from this perspective, but we are fundamentally the same consciousness observing itself. So we're really just interacting with these mirrors. We're not really interacting with quote unquote others. Um, so that just changes the dynamic of what is it that I'm quote unquote healing or what is it that I'm transforming? And that's where I say that, you know, the biggest integration of 5-MeO-DMT is your relationship as an individuated node of consciousness and being that re the relationship of that to the universal divine consciousness and being. That's what you're fundamentally integrating, not what was my relationship with my mom or my dad who sexually abused me or the people that I shot when I was a soldier and you know my feelings of guilt around that. Like those are all important things. So I, I don't want to say that, you know, these forms of healing that they're insignificant, but this just gives you the perspective of the totality that like oh, fuck, it's all me. And it's not about what other people did to me or I did, did to other people, but it's like, it's how do I take responsibility for being myself in this version of myself? So it's just, it's a completely different dynamic that we're dealing with there. And one of the things that I love about 5MEO, going back to all the stuff about beliefs and you know religion and, and all of that, is that, I like to view it as this great equalizer that it doesn't really matter what you think or believe that if you go far enough within the experience, you'll come back with the same thing that I've already said, like, Oh shit, I think I'm God. I, I think that's all that really exists, that that's a, an experience that anybody can have. And then you can observe like, Oh yeah, there's where I want to believe that I'm a soul on some kind of journey across lifetimes. Like, that's my belief. Like that's a construct. I made that up. You can see that come back. And then yeah. you could also start to feel the inauthenticity of it. Like, Ooh, you know, it's kind of like you were saying that you observe yourself like, Oh, I'm operating from the egoic programming. And I did, wasn't even thinking about it, but you become aware of it. You start to see it this in all these different aspects of your life. So it's yeah. just, it's the greatest truth serum that exists within reality. You, you it just, it. Yeah. It just dumps you into Guess what? Here it, it is. It, yeah, it is. I call it yeah, that egoic alarm. You, you nailed it. That's a perfect explanation of what happens. It is. You will find yourself playing a character or in the midst of character and the alarm will go off and you're like, yeah. I'm doing there. But that is the truth. And that's the truth. How folks could shift and move forward. But it's unique in that sense. Um, but you brought up a, a, a really neat point, too, especially as we're talking about integration 
And even the facilitation of this, I mean, folks that are listening to this, this is not the same experience as these other experiences. It's like, you know, the amount of change that could happen in a very short period of time is, is astronomical, but also on the same, you know, on the flip side of that coin, the amount of trauma um, or poor experiences could be experienced as well. And we both do integration. A lot of the folks that have been integrating over the last year are people that have had poor um, facilitation experiences that have been in, in a space with somebody either not trained properly or just the experience did not go uh, according to plan. And some of those negative side effects, some of those, those are some of the most difficult um, situations that I'm seeing in the psychedelic space. But what I want to touch on is, is your piece and where, where you mentioned, which again was perfect. As you go into this, if you go in with any type of concept of what it is, religion is the perfect example. And that's where I was trying to go with this is somebody goes into the space with this religious dogma. I believe X, Y, and Z and, and, and a good friend of mine who was a youth pastor, serious Christian down the Christian rabbit hole as I was within 15 minutes, all that goes away. Yeah. No matter how much you want to continue to believe that, and almost no matter how much you need to believe that, there is this part of you that knows it's not true. There's a part right. of you that can see that it is this belief. And that can be traumatizing for people. Um, you know, and, and, and I always say, you know, part of the intake process is, do these folks have some scaffolding to land on, right? If their worldview, you know, I, I was joking to say, if I go to the Home Depot here in Iowa and pull one of these farmers out of his F-150, who's never thought of non-duality or any of these things, and you put him in that position, it could possibly put him in a bad space because it's going to tear apart everything that he's ever thought. So the, you know, the upfront process that I think is extremely important to make sure that somebody is, is, is properly prepared for this. But once they go through that, again, those lens that, that special lens that you have, I call it the Bufo lens, 5MO lens, then the other experiences seem to change. But from your standpoint, again, looking at these other psychedelics, and we talk about the difference of 5MO, what would be the integration difference? Or is there a difference from your perspective on how you would integrate that experience? Well, one of the primary differences um, between integrating a 5-MEO experience versus virtually any other psychedelic experience is, one, most other psychedelics provide you with certain levels of content and certain levels of narration. You can say, well, this happened, then I saw this, <clears throat> then I thought this, then I felt that, then I released that, this was the result, and then I went back to thinking about this other thing. So we can put it into some kind of narrative structure, and then we can have certain characters. And, you know, in the same sense that we could, we can watch a movie and we can ask like, okay, well, what were the dynamics of the movie? Like, how did the character change? What was the character arc? Where was the denouement? Where, where was the big climax? Um, we can ask those kinds of questions of like a mushroom experience or an ayahuasca experience. Um, and then also, you know, we can talk about, well, what did you feel? And then how did you engage with what you feel? Okay, so did you cry? Did you purge? Did you know? Did you curl up in a ball? Did you try and run away? We can talk about behaviors and things like that. And all of these things are very significant. And they, they also apply to 5-MEO to some extent. But what we're not getting in most experiences with 5-MEO is a clear narrative. There is, I took a hit and then, oh my God. And then... 15 minutes later, I found myself on the other side of the room crying in ecstasy, thinking it's all so beautiful. And then what what just happened? What happened? Yeah. Right? So that's a common thing. And then also what we get with 5MEO, this is not this is not a malfunction of the experience. Um many, many people do not remember what took place during that time period because the ego was not there. And then we also get some really interesting stuff where um, the cons what we can see really clearly is that there are conscious structures of the ego and then there are also unconscious structures of the ego. And there's actually a lot more unconscious ones than there are conscious ones. And what can happen is that someone can completely lose track of the conscious part of the ego. So in other words, Kirby goes away, Martin goes away, but then there might be this acting out that is taking place from these unconscious patterns of the ego. 
And this can be really surprising that someone might say when, when their conscious ego comes back, they say, wow, I was like perfectly silent and I didn't move. Right. And then the other people tell them, no, actually you were screaming and yelling and you were flipping around the room. And they're like, what, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't remember doing any of that. It seemed like I wasn't doing that to me. So we get this radical disjuncture between yeah. what is consciously manifesting and what is unconsciously manifesting. And um, we don't tend to see that with other psychedelics, that people don't say, well, I don't know what happened for the last two hours. You know, it does happen, but it tends to be very rare. But this is, this is a yeah. common aspect of 5-MeO. And also... Um, we get these just very, very visceral sensations of energy and how energy is moving through our being or manifesting. And this is just, you know, your, your energetic level goes from zero to infinity within a number of seconds. And most other psychedelics, they just can't produce anything that's even nearly comparable to that. And what this does is, you know, for example, you can take someone who's done a lot of therapeutic work or spiritual work with, say, a more traditional psychedelic like psilocybin and ayahuasca, and they maybe think that they've kind of cleared out all their garbage, which, you know, everybody's got. And then they take 5-MeO. And a common comment that I've heard from people who are coming from these camps of, of having worked with other psychedelics and feel like they've really transformed or released a lot through it is they say, well, 5-ME have found what I was holding on to that I didn't even know that I was holding on yeah. to that has been there my entire life that nothing else ever even remotely touched. So it just has a depth to it that also is incomparable. So there's a lot of aspects to it that are very, very unique. And also what this can show up on other medicines, but it tends to be much rather rare is that we get these spontaneous um, body positions and movements that arise within the 5-MeO experience. And I have a lot of analysis for like what's going on there and, and how we can understand these movements and these positions and body structures. But that that's a whole nother grammar that just doesn't apply to ayahuasca right. or mushrooms. I mean, actually it does apply, but we don't, know that it applies because we don't reach the same level of energetic intensity that we reach with 5-MeO-DMT. Right. So this is where people are spontaneously showing these fluid symmetrical body movements. And they're, you know, they're making these mudras with their hands and they're making these sounds and they're doing these things. And almost always all of this stuff happens. And when the ego comes back, you can tell someone that you were just doing all these things. Like, what do you mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Whereas if we're having some kind of movements that are taking place on ayahuasca, people know that it's happening. It's like, oh, I feel the energy moving me. Like when I was going to the Santo Daime church, um, I learned people's um, signatures where it's like, oh yeah, that's the guy who every time he starts to get charged up, he starts dancing around the room and he's going pew, 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 pew with his fingers, right? And then oh, well, there's the woman who's always sobbing uncontrollably, rocking back and forth. So these these movements right, and right. things they do show up but again the difference is they know they're doing it and they might say wow i don't know who's doing it but i i i still am aware that i'm doing this but whereas in 5meo these events show up and these embodiments take place that people yeah. then are not aware of and like so this is something that ralph metzner comments on in his book the toad and the jaguar and one of the things that just made me cringe when i read his book because you know he's talking about how well people make these mudras and he said oh well that's when the god and he, he's referring to like shiva and you know like you know these archetypal deities like, that's when these deities actually possess your body and it's like oh my god like even he missed it that there are no archetypal deities out there it's just it's you inhabiting your body from the universal level. But even, even there, Ralph Metzner wanted to put a name and a face and an identity like, oh, well, this is Shiva or this is Kali or, or this is a possession experience. And it, that's just, it's just fundamentally incorrect. That's not what's going on there. And so that's why I say that it's learning how to embody yourself from an energetically authentic perspective and mode of operation so that you're not just operating from these unconscious patternings. You're not just 
unconsciously playing yeah. the role of who you are, but you're actually in touch with yourself energetically because fundamentally what we are, are beings of infinite energy. That's what God is. And this energy works in these various forms of geometric and fractal structures that want to be expressed through our speech, through our emotions, through our um, body language, and that we're so busy playing the character that we're constantly shaping this energy to look and sound and act a certain way that we either consciously or unconsciously believe that it should. And so we're mm -hmm. not actually in touch with what we are authentically, energetically experiencing at any moment because we're always filtering it through layers of this is what I think, this is what I want, this is what I want to get, this is what I, I want other people to think of me, this is how I want to yes. be, rather than what is the raw input and what is the raw output. And that's what yeah. shows up on 5-MEO. It's completely unfiltered because there's no filter there to filter it anymore. And that's where we get to see people as they really are versus you know again in in another context with a lesser order medicine that doesn't have this capacity we're still going to see people acting out the various characters that they believe themselves to be or the characters that they believe they're working with that they believe they're working with spiritual entities or divine archetypes that they're going to embody and act those out but it's still just an act and that's one of the things that 5meo just really lands really really hard is like my God, everybody's acting like all the time and they don't even know it. Um, and I would like to do something different for myself. I mean, that's how it landed with me. It's like, wow, I, I don't want to be that way, actually. I just, I want to be in touch with my authentic energy so that I can be and express that. It, it could be disruptive. I mean, it, yes. again, if folks haven't experienced this and even some of the folks that have experienced, I work with a lot of folks that in, in some levels, it strengthened the ego. I'm like, hang on, yeah. this did yeah. the opposite of what it should do. You're even more special now. How'd that operate? So for some folks, they can do that. And again, I can tell some folks that I think that struggle with the experience are the ones that are so vested in that character. And, and like, you know, the people spend their entire lives trying to defend this character that they've created. It's like, I'm this, don't you see it? I, I am this, don't you see it? And it's this constant, you know, push and sell of what they think that they are, what they think they should be, or what they think you should think they should be, yeah. um, that they're so caught up in that cell that they're missing that that is just a version of themselves. But once you're able to see that authentic piece, because that is one of the warnings to folks for me is that they step into it. I warn them. I'm like, once you see your own ego, you're going to see everybody else's ego. And you've got to get yourself to a level of compassion because at first it's a little frustrating. Yeah. But then you, again, if you could see it right, you could see, wow, what a blessing that I've had this opportunity. So I can see things the way that I see. I didn't see it before I did this. So how could I expect that person? So then you're able to walk around and give a little bit more forgiveness and a little bit more compassion for people that are playing out these characters. I mean, I meet people all the time as I'm out at a speaking or teaching and they come up and they introduce my, themselves to me. And it's like, it's always the resume. I always joke when I say, here yeah. comes the resume. Yeah. I'm blip, 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 blip. Here's all the things that I do that I'm special. And are you seeing all this? Are you taking it all in? Are you seeing me in that way? And I'm just looking at folks like you're in there. You're not this person. This is a character, great character. You're more than that. And I wish I could show you that because this conversation would go completely differently. Um, but it, it is to to the original question. And again, I want to be value, uh, be uh, protective of your time here. The integration is different because in a traditional integration uh, session, as far as I'm concerned, it's like you said, you've got this intellectual information either through feelings or thoughts or this dream this vision this 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 thing that you you, you experience in some fashion through the senses um, so you've got this and then now you can take that and create some sort of action plan or some sort of decoding of okay what happened what do i do with this now how do i implement it because a, a traditional integration would just be insights into action Right. would be integration, right? How do we apply that to our lives? And most people are failing at traditional integration. I think integration is, like you said, when I first started, there was no integration. Um, I did my 5MAO experience. Nobody even talked to me afterwards. I just got in a car and went home thinking, what just happened to you? Um, and it took several of those for me to start piecing together what was happening. But not everybody has that opportunity. But for a lot of folks, for the 5MEO experience, like you said, it's like the, the experience is, I don't know what happened. More than, 
So I've actually started shifting a lot of the folks that we're working with. The introduction is trying to give them some idea without really creating too much of a giving them too much information of what to expect, how to navigate the experience. I mean, the first part of the experience to me is the most powerful energetic experience a human can have, right? That yeah. somatic experience. Right. And if it's a full release and you're quote unquote offline at that experience, as you said, all sorts of things could happen that uh, all sorts of things could happen in that space, but that is the energetic release. That is, that is an important piece of it that most folks aren't even aware that is happening. Then as you start coming back online, that's when this realization of, oh, there I am, there's my character, there's my role, there's my ego, that's what I'm doing. And again, so many people have that first experience right then where they want to say something on the mat. And then the later they'll say, oh, I almost said this because, you know, I wanted you guys to think or feel or you, I can start seeing their ego come in because one of the first questions are, I'm, I'm taking too much time. Right. I'm taking too much time here. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's been 15 minutes. Right. That's your ego. Let, let it go. So it is different because most folks, again, that initial experience, they don't even know what happened. So I think from an integration standpoint, it, it is important if folks are having five of your experiences. And that's not to say that a traditional integration specialist can't do amazing work with it. But I think someone that understands the arc of that uh, journey, the arc of that process and actually what is happening. Yeah. And again, even the conversations we're having and, and you're doing a significantly better job than me. If you haven't had five to these can sound like strange conversations. What does he mean? He's playing a character. What, what, what does that mean? Until you could literally see the difference between who you are and the characters you're playing. This can sound like gibberish. So if that is your experience, how are you going to integrate somebody that has had that experience? So it is a different, uh, to me, an integration standpoint. The first step from, from my standpoint is I call it helping them land the experience. What even happened? Yeah. What has happened to you? Um, and even like simple analogies, it's almost like your iPhone. If it wants to put new software, it, you know, it shuts you down. You get shut down. New software is introduced. Old bugs and viruses are pulled out that you turn back online and you may not know exactly what happened to your phone yet till you maybe open up the camera later and you're like, Oh, that that's what that's happened. different. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's what I think some of the, the differences between these experiences uh, from an integration standpoint. Um, I'll ask you one last question. And I, again, I want to be uh, cautious well, of your well, time, actually, but, but before yeah. you ask the question though, there's a couple things there that you mentioned that I just want to go back and highlight. Um, one is that, I personally don't think that anyone who hasn't had a full release dose of 5-MeO-DMT and not only has had the experience, but has had it multiple times and has learned how it's transformed them, I don't think that they're qualified to help anybody integrate a 5-MeO-DMT experience. So or I don't to facilitate it. Right, right. You, you, to facilitate it, you've got to be on this level and then also to help people integrate. So in other words... Somebody might be a psychedelic integration specialist, and they're really comfortable working with people with mushrooms or MDMA or ayahuasca. But if they are not amply experienced with 5-MeO-DMT at a personal level, they're not going to be able to help Agreed. people integrate a 5-MeO experience. Um, also, one of the things, like, like you mentioned, that this is like the highest level of energy that the human body can ever process and experience, which is where also... This is very different from quote unquote traditional non-duality in the sense of I'm going to get that through meditation and just quieting everything down. And so this is where also people who, you know, there are people out there who are non-dual therapists who offer therapy from a non-dual perspective, but they're mostly coming from this intellectual spiritual approach. Yes, They're not coming from the immediacy of the embodied energetic approach. They too are not qualified really to help somebody with the energetic event that is 5-MeO-DMT and helping people to understand it. And because it is this most radical energetic experience that is just off the charts from anything else you could ever possibly imagine... We also, what's really unique about 5-MeO is that we get these after effects. We get these reverberations that continue on after the experience where, you know, the, the language has come to be called reactivations or we have the, the mm -hmm. concepts of night school where people are trying to go to sleep and suddenly they think they're right back in 5-MeO or they wake up at two in the morning and they're right back in 5-MeO or somebody sits down to meditate and suddenly they're right back in 5-MeO or somebody's making love and they're like, oh my God, it's going into 5-MeO. Like I'm becoming my partner. Like, oh my God, oh my God. 
And this can be very unnerving to have these kinds of experiences, yeah. but they're a common part of it. Whereas when your mushroom experience is done, you can walk away from it. When your ayahuasca experience is done, you can walk away from it. You're not going to get these kinds of energetic reverberations. So it's kind of like you're saying with like rebooting the iPhone in some sense that these reverberations, they last much, much longer than the medicine experience itself. And so this reformatting process, and I yes. always use the word process, it's not an event it's not an experience and it is not about what insights you had because your insights are always filtered through your ego. It's this energetic reconditioning and recalibration process, which once you've taken 5-MeO-DMT, you've agreed to this process. And that's also why, just in concert with what you've been saying, educate yourself before you go and take it because that's one of the most difficult places when when I get an integration call from somebody who said, well, I didn't want to know anything about it before I took it. And now all this stuff is happening to me and I don't know what in the world is going on. And I'm also, I'm kind of thinking that I'm God. And I, I don't even know if I could even think that thought is like, is that okay for me to even think that, you know? So this is where educating yourself and understanding that there is this ontological shock that takes place and that these energetic reverberations will continue on after the event. And that's what's just fundamentally unique about 5-MeO. And that's why it requires specialized integration consultants, people who actually know what is normal within this realm. And that this is another place where, again, facilitators, you need to have a lot of experience because sometimes I do get integration clients who say, well, this is my experience. And then this is what my facilitator told me that they saw. And then my facilitator said they'd never seen anything like it. And what the person is telling me is like, oh, no, this is totally normal. Like there's nothing abnormal about what you've just described. And if your facilitator says that this was unusual or abnormal, that's a clear indication that they don't have enough experience because yeah. this is this is normal. But understanding what is normal requires a lot of study, a lot of practice, a lot of observation, and a lot of experience. And, you know, so again, this is where I have spent, you know, the past 16 years now, almost um, 15 years, trying to communicate as clearly and succinctly as I can. This is what 5-MEO does. Here's how it works. These are the ranges of the experiences. These are the ranges of the reactions. Here's how the ego goes offline. Here's what happens when the ego is acting unconsciously. Here's what happens when we are embodying this energy. Here's what's happening when we're releasing. Here's what's happening as we're reintegrating. Here's are the reverberations that happen after, after the event. And here's how your whole self-concept is going to be shifting and changing and reorienting around this new sense of self. And so there's a lot to learn there and that... You know, often people tell me that they read my books before they have a 5-MEO experience and they're grateful. And then they say, and then I go back and then after my experience, I reread it three or four more times. And each time I read it, I was seeing more and more that you were telling me about what my experience was and I'm understanding it on a deeper and deeper level. So it's not just like a, oh, I've got it, you know, that you got to ferment in this for quite a while to really come to peace with the experience. Well, it'd be like um, the folks that you, you mentioned earlier that have a specialization in non-duality. If you have not had that embodied experience, and that's that is the piece of this, you can intellectually think about any of these spiritual concepts till you're blue in the face. Doesn't matter. Um, I meet so many people. I understand that, right? I always yeah. get those folks. I, I've I've had that non-dual experience during meditation. I hear that a lot, and I'm like, maybe. I'm not here to say that you haven't. There's levels to this game. I could assure you that, though. Um, and, and maybe you've been to that and maybe you haven't. But I think in, in, in closing, I think what's important for folks to, to understand is this is a different molecule. This is a different medicine. This is a different sacrament. This is a different psychedelic, whatever word feels right for you. It is not the same. The term God molecule to me is probably as spot on as you can be because of not just the experience, but the seriousness of the experience. Yeah. Again, um, you know, when I want to close with was questions about safety and responsibility, I think we've touched on a lot of it. I think if you have any plans of stepping into this space, you have to do your research, not just on what the experience is, but the facilitator. Like uh, Martin, I've been talking about a facilitation or five minute where I'm going to have a five meal facilitation course. 
he's going to help out with it. We're launching that in March. It's going to be a six month training where we spend a week in person actually facilitating this medicine. There's not enough safety protocols out there in a lot of the facilitations I've seen. We were talking before we hopped on here. There's some videos that you watch on YouTube and see how some of this medicine is facilitated. And to be honest, it's just inappropriate for, for lack of better terms. And I have no desire to throw other people under the bus, make it seem like I've got it all figured out and I'm special. Um, my concern is about this space and how it's being held down, so to speak. And folks that are in the 5MO community like us, we think a lot more people know about it than they do. I was at the Phoenix conference and yeah. I had the booth and my booth said 5MO and everybody almost that walked up to it was, you know, and then dimethyltryptoline tradition. I've done DMT. Yeah. Yeah. I was amazed at how few people actually knew about it. So with that, there's some pros and cons. That means a lot more folks have an opportunity for some amazing healing through this, this medicine, this molecule, but it also means there's some opportunity for, um, for some inappropriate actions in that space. And to me, inappropriate actions are people that are not being screened properly. Um, and again, I'm not trying to pick on people or throw them under the bus, but just to be honest, from a warning standpoint, the traveling circuses, I'd be cautious where you sign up, you pay your 250, you show up, there's 35 people, you've never talked to the facilitator, they don't know your medical background, and you go through an experience and then you go home. That was my first experience. And yes, it was life-saving and I was just lucky that I was able to navigate that experience, but I'm also integrating, and I know you have, we've had these conversations of people that did not get yeah. as lucky as I was uh, or you were and are really struggling with it. So again, this is a serious medicine. If it's something that you have uh, a desire to learn more about, great. Go to the unchurchchurch.com. You can look at some of our courses. But if you've had this experience and you're really looking to maximize it, I think integration in, in general is just a term that, again, is as you said, when we we were into this space, it was just a non-used term. Now it's almost overused. Yeah. Um, and very few people are doing it. They're like, yeah, I meditated. I read a couple of books. I journaled. Um, yeah. integration is really how you take an experience and make it a 10 X. And in, in, in my opinion, it, it really can magnify the, the, what, what you get out of these experiences. But when it comes to five MEO, if I just think it's vital uh, yeah. to the point where folks that work with me now, um, I used to encourage integration. Now I just, it's mandatory. I, I, I make it part of the package. So you're paying for it. So you're more likely to show up for it than folks that are like, it's an add on. It's no longer an add on. It is a part of the process. And to your point, the process and the process starts with the first phone conversation that you have with somebody all the way through the entire integration process. This isn't one of those medicines that you just show up on the weekend, you take it and you scoot. I don't think. Um, that being said, thoughts, uh, anything in closing that you want to share? Yeah, I just want to echo just a few of the points that you just raised that one of the things about 5-MeO-DMT is that it does present to many people as being fundamentally simple. Like, so for me, my first full experience with 5-MeO-DMT, I, I took a hit and within seconds, it was like, oh my God, God is the only thing that exists. And then I came back down from that. I was just like, that's, that was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. I want everyone on this planet to have that experience because that experience definitely answered my questions and changed me at a level that nothing else ever possibly could. And so when people have an experience like that, it's very common for people to say, wow, I want to share this with everyone. Yes. I want my whole family to have this experience. I want everyone to have this experience. And then through more practice and observation, I was able to see oh, actually, a lot of people have a lot more difficult time with this than yes. I did, which isn't to say anything special about me. It's just different people are different. And that it really is like, look, you're going to dissolve into God. Are you ready for that? And even the, the conscious mind will say, oh, yeah, I'm ready, or that's what I want. And then when it arises, like, no, please make it stop. No, no, no. And so there's, I mean, literally... You are introducing people, as we have said, into the most intense embodied energetic experience that is possible for a human being to have. Now, just put it into that context. And then if you want to be casual and cavalier about it, it's like, what are you doing? And if you don't have enough experience with it, again, it's what are you doing? That it's so much more than just putting some material in a pipe and lighting it for people and then 15 minutes later saying, oh, great, you did it, bro. 
awesome. Um, that's, that's not facilitation, you know, that, 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 that's something else, but it's deceptively simple in that sense. And people, I think often they look at it that way and they don't really understand this is fundamentally going to change people's lives. And if I do my part poorly, I could really fuck it up for this person. Um, and so there's so much more than just providing the space and lighting a pipe for people and the impacts of, of what people are going through that, again, we are giving people direct access to their nature as God. That is not something that should be taken lightly by anyone, should not be taken casually by anyone, because it is a mind breaker. It is a world breaker. It will shatter whatever it is that you think that you are. This will shatter it. And even as we've been saying, even if you have that belief, like, well, actually, no, I, I believe that we are all one and that, that there's only one consciousness. When you experience it vibrating and every little molecule of your being, that's a lot different than having an idea. This is yeah. not an idea. And so how we grapple with that is it's just not comparable to any other experience that we could have. So that's why it's so important that there be proper education, proper training, proper facilitation around all of this. And that for people who just want to pick it up because it seems so easy, just you know, I'll let you know, it definitely is not, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's super easy, you know, and the client is just like, that was amazing. Thank you. Anything you need to talk about? No, I am good. This is exactly what I was looking for. But then you take somebody else who's like, I've built my whole life around illusions and I've never even been true to myself. And, and, and I'm now realizing I don't have the faintest clue how to love myself or what to do. What, what are you going to do with that person? Yeah. You know, so yeah, let's, let's be serious about it. And I always like to say, let's take it seriously. It doesn't mean we have to be all super serious all the time. That's another thing that I don't like is when people get into, oh, but this is sacred. It's so sacred. It's so sacred, sacred, sacred. We got to make it sacred, sacred, sacred. And we're going to really emphasize about how to make it sacred. Okay. That's, that's a belief system. That's an idea. Like I really like saying, look, this isn't sacred. This is just what's real. Do you want to deal with truth or do you want to re deal with made up stuff? Okay. So let's deal with the real. And then again, just on the integration part, like I see, you know, these posts on Instagram, like integration, spend time in nature, meditate, get a massage, get some acupuncture. And that's like, that is like the most low level integration we could yeah. ever possibly talk about that. That's like fucking junk food integration that, yeah, all those things are good. But if you think you're going to manage your 5-MeO DMT breakthrough with some acupuncture and taking walks in nature, you're in for a big surprise. And, yeah. you know, when, when you're ready to deal with the surprise, you know, come talk to me or come talk to Kirby and, you know, we'll talk about it. But that kind of stuff that's is not going to cut it, that that's just like cookie cutter playground stuff, honestly. And, you know, it, sometimes it works great for people who have gone through their mushroom or ayahuasca experience. Like, oh, yeah, I'm getting a massage and, oh, I'm loving it and I'm getting some acupuncture and I'm just going to spend time in nature, which, again, all those things are good. I love spending time in nature. But if you think just sitting out in nature and meditating and breathing for a little bit, if that's going to integrate your 5-MEO experience where your entire sense of reality has just been shattered and reformatted into something that you could never possibly expect, it's going to take a lot of time sitting in nature and maybe most of us don't have that much time because, you know, you got to go back to work on Monday or whatever it is. So. Well, as always, I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you pulling all the weight tonight on the, on the podcast. Um, of course, everything you say is just, it's, it's spot on. So I'm always grateful to have you. Uh, let me give you this to close out. Let's again, from an integration standpoint, um, I know folks that are listening are having psychedelic experiences, whether they're five MAO experiences or not. I think, and again, this is going to, maybe I shouldn't close with this. I think if you can integrate 5MAO experiences, immigrate, uh, integrating traditional experiences significantly, not easier, it's different, but I think there's levels to it. So I think if you're integrating 5MAO experiences, uh, integrating psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, that's that's all manageable. That's what you do for a living. Um, what other projects do you have out or how else can folks learn about you? How folks could support you? Yeah, sh share anything that you'd like, please. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Kirby. So if you, if anybody who's watching or listening to this, if 
you want to talk to somebody who knows this stuff inside and out. Um, and I specialize in 5-MeO DMT, but I'm not in any way limited to that, that I'm well experienced with most psychedelic medicines. Um, my website for that is nondualandtheogenicintegration.com. I offer 30, 60, and 90-minute video calls. Um, I also have my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Martin W. Ball. And for there, my two highest levels of the cap level and the God molecule level, if you sign up at those levels, it's a little bit less than my regular rate for consultations, but you get a monthly 30 or 60 minute call at those levels. I also do work with a number of people who facilitate 5-MeO. Um, they bring me their their difficult cases or uh, perhaps they're still in their, their learning or training part of their experience. And so they just look for feedback. Um, so people come and usually share their experiences and what they saw when they were facilitating. And again, it, like, is that normal or what would you do? So I give people a lot of feedback in those capacities. Um, also, of course, my books are available. You can find them on Amazon. Um, they're available in paperback, ebook, and also audio book. And um, I've written a number of books about 5-MeO DMT. They're quite easy to find, just like Martin W. Ball. And uh, my personal website is martinball.net. And I'm really easy to get in touch and speak with and um, I do work with people from around the world, and that's that's another thing that's really different about 5-MeO now versus when I first started experiencing it in 2008, that most people in the world didn't know what it was, but now it it really is spreading out around the globe. So I do get clients from pretty much all over the place, and I'm always comfortable working with people from any background, any orientation. I do have, I have no particular biases against anyone or for anyone that uh, I'm interested in helping fellow human beings really yes. integrate the fact that each and every one of us is the same being just in different forms. Amen. Well, I'd say folks check out his books for sure. I've read a number of them. Um, they've changed my life. And again, uh, maybe sounds egoically. I thought I was pretty dialed in with what was happening. This is when I read your book, it was the first time that I heard somebody else it was like that. That's it. That's what I've been experiencing. That's what I've been thinking. But I haven't heard that from somebody else. And maybe that's why I have, you know, such a such a, a like for what you're doing and and, and, a, and a passion for for listening to you talk. Um, is it okay if I tell folks that you're going to be helping us with our five meal facilitation course? Is that okay if I share that? Yeah, absolutely. And also, I, it didn't occur to me that I should share my podcast, The Entheogenic yeah. Evolution, um, which. 5-MeO DMT is one of the main topics that I bring people on to talk about. And unlike today where I'm just talking, 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 because I'm the guest, um, I do bring people on and let them share their experiences and their perspectives. And so I've been running the podcast, The Entheogenic Evolution, since 2008, um, quite possibly is the oldest longest running psychedelic podcast on the planet at this point. Um, but 5-MeO is a regular topic of conversation on my podcast. And I've also been sharing uh, chapters from the audiobook of facilitating 5-MeO DMT, which mm -hmm. I'm currently sharing on the podcast and that comes out in between interviews. But there's a new episode every Monday comes out and you can find it wherever you find podcasts. I love it. And, uh, and I've been an honored guest on that. I, 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 yes, I like to think I do better as a guest than a host. So, um, but in closing again, I'll, 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 I'll pitch what we've got going on and then I'll let folks go. Um, we have started because of just this conversation in general, but we've had multiple conversations and this has been to me, the safe facilitation, the trauma informed safe facilitation of 5 MO DMT has been a passion of mine for years. Um, just again, as we've discussed throughout this podcast, the ways it could go right, the ways it could go wrong. It is important. It is a life-changing medicine, molecule, whatever you want to call it, entheogen. It's saved my life. It's changed my daughter's life, my son's life, and anybody that's been in my space. That's the beauty of this medicine is it's this ripple effect. I know when I work with a gentleman or, 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 or female and their life has changed, I'm just looking around them. I'm watching that cir yeah. circle of influence change because it is going to change things. Now, that being said, as we've discussed about the podcast, it is the God molecule, although it has this high propensity for change. If done incorrectly, it could also create trauma. And that's the importance. So a lot of folks, and again, when we we're talking earlier, folks that maybe have done it once or twice. And again, with this huge heart, want to share that experience with other people. I know the 
the intent is right. I want to share this with other people. If you don't understand what this medicine is doing, you, you, you need to reconsider that. It is, well, someday, unfortunately, and hopefully you won't have the bad experience of that soccer mom that I met that had a bad experience that's been having a horrible experience for over a year or yeah. a gentleman that we both shared um, with from abroad that was in Spain that's been having two years yeah. because they had a very bad um, you know, experience with this, this, this medicine. So the facilitation of it is not like others. It's not like a psilocybin where somebody has a neighbor that says, Hey, I'll sit with you. This is not the medicine for that. Yeah. So that being said, it is um, something that we've taken extremely seriously. So we've been working on it for actually over a year and a half now, a five MEO facilitation course. It's got uh, trauma informed as a component. Now that's a word that's being overused right now, just to be perfectly honest, but I'm not going to allow other folks who have used it maybe inappropriately to take away from the fact that that is how we're going to do it. We're having a guest at Chiratan, who is a worldwide uh, TED Talk speaker who's known for her trauma-informed uh, conversations, especially as it relates to facilitation of psychedelic medicines. Um, we've got Martin Ball that's going to be a, a guest teacher. We're creating this package. It's going to be a seven or a six-month training protocol um, or we're going to be online every week meeting, talking about it. We'll we'll go through everything in detail, and then we'll have a week together where we'll actually be facilitating this medicine and learning, getting our hands on it, taking it ourselves. So that experiential piece, I think, is what's going to make it different than a lot of trainings out there. But in closing, if that's something you have an interest to, reach out. Um, but as always, I'm, I'm really grateful for your time. I'm sorry I took more than we agreed to, but I, I appreciate it as always, and I thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on because as you know, I'm a talker. Just like ask me a question and I'll get going. So thank you for asking the questions today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you.